Pokemon fans, Tamashi here. Today I want to do something a little bit different. I often get requests that, while they sound interesting, couldn't really stand alone as an entire video. And as much as I love working on my glitch videos, I need a little break from them to get my stamina back, because they're a ton of work. So today I'm going to do a viewer request special and pile a bunch of topics into one video. I have a nice little handful of requests to cover, so let's get started. Hylian and Samurai requests the top 5 Pokemon spin-off games. This is going in viewer requests, at least for right now, simply because there are quite a few newer spin-off games that I haven't had any extensive playtime with. I may revisit this topic later for a full top 10, as I collect and play more of the spin-offs I've missed. But at the time, I'm limited to what I have experience with, so consider this more of a tentative list to tide you over until I do a full top 10, which may or may not reflect the opinions I'm going to express right now. And actually, I'm going to shorten this to a top 4, because I can't think of 5 right now that I have that much to say about. Let's go! Number 4, Pokemon Rumble Blast. I never did play the original Pokemon Rumble, but Rumble Blast was a cool experience. There's not an awful lot to it. Each Pokemon only has one or two attacks, and the gameplay doesn't require you to do more than mash buttons, but it's satisfying nonetheless. It's a way to make the action of Pokemon real-time rather than turn-based, without losing all the moves and abilities of each unique Pokemon. And not really too many Pokemon spin-off games have attempted to do much with real-time fighting, which makes Rumble Blast a pretty fresh experience. I actually got this game to play with my little brother who lives in California, only to discover that there's no online multiplayer, only local, which is a huge bummer. But aside from that, it's a nice distraction, and has some fun gameplay, even if it is a little shallow mechanically. And the toy shop theme definitely clicks with my collector's mentality. Number 3, Hey You Pikachu. This game gets a lot, and I mean a lot, of flack. It didn't age well at all, and a lot of people seem to have really bad memories of it as well. Maybe it's just that I didn't have high standards as a kid, and that I didn't have a million other ways to entertain myself, but I loved it to death. It gave me a chance to experience what living with a Pokemon, having fun with them, exploring with them could be like, and that to me made the game worthwhile. It explored the part of the Pokemon universe the main games couldn't, and let you live out daily life in the Pokemon world with the Pokemon by your side. Yes, Pikachu could be disobedient, but that just added to the realism for me. Have you ever had a pet that completely did everything you wanted it to and never misbehaved? Why would you expect a creature as smart as a Pikachu to? It was more of a role-playing experience for me. And though for some, there's just not enough gameplay to justify it, all you need is a little imagination to get something enjoyable out of it. My one gripe with the game is that I had a little difficulty getting Pikachu to understand me at times. Mike seemed pretty responsive like 99% of the time, but if I tried to go to Ochre Woods, Pikachu just didn't seem to understand at all what I wanted it to do, and that could get pretty frustrating. So yeah, it's not a perfect game by any means, and it's not for everyone. But I personally have fond memories playing it, and I think for that, it deserves a spot on this list. Number 2, Pokemon Snap. For us in the West, and probably most of the world, Pokemon Snap was an extremely unique game. Not many had attempted to take a genre like the first-person shooter and find a new way to use its defining mechanics, at least not like Snap did. It wasn't until recently that I discovered there was actually an entire subgenre of camera-based first-person shooters in Japan, with games like Tomoyo no Video Dai Saksen, based on the Card Captor Sakura franchise, taking a cinematography approach to the concept. Still, I think Pokemon Snap was a pioneer even in that market, and though it may be light on content, especially compared to newer games, it provides an experience like no other game can. It was a creative outlet for me as a kid, and it gave us a glimpse of Pokemon in their natural habitat that the main games just couldn't provide. Professor Oak's rating system was a little silly and tended to ignore the rules of actual photography, but it didn't stop me from trying to take the best pictures I could and beat my own high scores. Whether Snap should have a sequel or not isn't something I feel strong about. As much as I adored this game, I don't know if I could enjoy it the same way now as I could as a kid, and it feels like it was really a product of its time during the height of Pokemania. Recreating the experience isn't something I'm passionate about. For what it was, I loved it. And whether a sequel happens at some point or not, the original and the experience I had with it will always hold a special place in my heart. And my number one favorite spin-off game is Pokemon Pinball. My personal favorite spin-off game is also my first video game ever. Pokemon Pinball is what I got on Christmas as a kid to go with my lime green Game Boy Color. My parents knew I wanted a Pokemon game, but since I was still learning to read, they figured I wouldn't be able to understand red and blue. So they got me Pinball instead, and to this day I can waste hours playing it. I actually made a full review of this game four years ago, so if you feel like cringing at old awkward on camera me, you can just go watch it if you really want an in-depth look at this game. But really, it's just a pretty standard pinball game with a lot of nostalgic value for me. It's still fun to try and beat my old high scores, and though I've never been good at pinball, just slowly getting better than younger me feels satisfying. It's by no means the best, but it was my first, and I'll never forget it. Mama Lizma's requests an updated Pokemon collection video, or just update the website. My collection actually hasn't grown too terribly much since I made my last collection video, because living in an apartment, you just run out of space. 
And my collection website is unfortunately kind of dead at the moment, because I lack a good space to photograph items, and a good camera too, and like time, and money for image hosting. But even though I might not get really meticulous and show you every single new addition to my collection over the past year or so, I can at least show you some of my cooler new items. In the games department, I've gotten my hands on quite a few more boxes and manuals from my old Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games as well as acquiring some new box editions entirely. A while back, I figured out that buying boxes for Pokemon games I already owned was a much cheaper way to have them complete in box than trying to buy them all in one. So I found some boxes that were on sale on their own and picked them up. Though they're not all in perfect shape, they do look nice on a shelf. The Sapphire one is actually a reproduction box, but the rest are all the original boxes. New complete in box games I picked up include Japanese Stadium 2, which is our Stadium 1, as well as boxed Japanese red and yellow versions, and a complete in box card GB2, which I was shocked to find for just $25 on an import site. Loose copies of this game often sell for $50 alone, and even complete in box copies in Japanese marketplaces tend to be priced pretty high, so this was a lucky find indeed. Gotta give props to my bro Jimmy for telling me about the sale. I've slowly been expanding my library Pokemon games thanks to 99 Gamers as well, picking up a ton of spin offs I've missed in the past. A viewer also sent me in this complete in box copy of Pokemon Typing Adventure, the Australian version, which was way cool. I don't have many new hardware editions, but I did manage to get myself a complete in box Pikachu Game Boy Advance SP. I saw this on display at Toys R Us as a kid when I went to go download my Mystery Mew in 2006, and I've wanted it ever since. This particular version is the Japanese release, but it comes in a very nice box, so I love it regardless. It's in great shape, and I admittedly don't use it much because I want to keep it that way. Regarding Pokemon games of the non-video variety, I've been sent multiple copies of Pokemon Monopoly, one of which I ended up doing a giveaway for at the end of 2012. It's pretty cool to own this one. My plush collection has pretty much exploded, to the point where I actually auctioned some off for charity at the end of last year. Partially this is because my younger brother decided he didn't want a lot of his Pokemon plushes anymore, so he sent me a huge box of them. The only really noteworthy addition to this collection is this complete in box electronic new plush. I saw this at Toys R Us as a kid and I wanted it so badly, but it was gone by the time I saved up my allowance for it. A viewer sent me this one last year, and now I actually own all three of the electronic plushes. Yay! Thank you so much! I really wish I could think of a good way to display this one. The box is pretty big. My figure collection has also ended up growing quite a bit, because another viewer donated almost a complete collection of the Burger King figures from the 99 promotion of the first movie. I never got to eat a Burger King much as a kid, and when I did, all I ever got was a shelter toy, so it's cool to finally own all the ones my friends had. In terms of media, I actually ended up with another Pokemon music box in the same series as my coveted Pikachu and Caterpie music box. This one has Poliwhirl and Squirtle on it, and the melody it plays is Hyakugo Juichi. I would show you, but it's complete in box and never open, so I kind of want to keep it that way. I bought this one myself, but a viewer actually sent another to me in the mail, which I donated to another Pokemon fan's collection. It's better off with somebody who doesn't have one than sitting as a duplicate in my own collection. In the apparel category, I actually ended up auctioning off most of my Pokemon shirts and clothes for charity, but I did get a couple new ones recently too, including some hats. I really love this Charizard hat, it looks like he's trying so hard to be gangster. I also expanded my selection of Pikachu headwear so that I don't sweat to death in my hoodie if I have to film when it's a little warmer out like it has been lately. My favorite addition to this collection are these custom love disc shirts that my boyfriend and I got to look like the Oris Young Couple Trainer class. They came from a seller on Redbubble, and though we obviously don't wear them together in public, they make cute pajama shirts. I'm sure there are lots of miscellaneous Pokemon items I've grabbed over the past year that I'm forgetting about, but thanks to all my viewers who are generous enough to send things in, and friends who work with the Pokemon company. Thanks to you guys, my collection has grown a pretty healthy amount even without me actively shopping around and collecting hardcore. Though I never expect gifts, and I often worry about running out of room so I don't encourage viewers to send me things, I treasure everything you all send in. To me, they're more valuable than even the rarest collector's grail. Thomas Lockwood requests making a video of all the fan art I get. Absolutely! Here's some of my favorite pieces of fan art. I have more on actual paper too that you all mail me, but that would be pretty hard to show on video. But here's a lot of really great stuff from around the internet that I'd love to show off. This requests Pokemon Contests. Pokemon Contests in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire haven't changed an awful lot from the original contests in Gen 3, 
but nevertheless I can see why it might be confusing for newcomers. It's fairly simple, but not actually all that straightforward, so I'm happy to give you a brief overview of the contest system and tips on how to play in it effectively. Preparing a Pokemon for a contest isn't terribly different from preparing one for battle, in that a lot of how well you do in the contest has to do with how well you've prepared your Pokemon. However, what will make a great Pokemon in battle often won't work out so well in contests, and vice versa. In contests, there are two important factors to keep in mind, your Pokeblocks and your moveset. Say I want to enter this puzzle in a cute contest. The first step I want to take is give it lots of pink Pokeblocks to raise its cuteness. When you first open the Pokeblock kit, you'll already have plenty of Pokeblocks of every color in there, and the color of the Pokeblock corresponds to the contest stat it will raise. So if you want to raise cuteness, we need to give it pink, if we wanted to raise beauty, we'd give it blue, cleverness would give it green, and so on. If you run out of Pokeblocks of a certain color, you can always make more from berries you find or grow. It's pretty simple to make Pokeblocks in Auras, since you don't have to worry about doing well in a minigame this time around. Just pop in berries and you'll instantly make blocks. These stats you're raising only have bearing on contests, not actual in-battle stats, and will help you out in the first round. Once our Plusle has as much cuteness as we can possibly give it, we need to make sure it has a good moveset for a cute contest. Since most of the moves Plusle can learn are cool rather than cute, this limits us some. But thanks to the move tutors, we can still work out a killer cute combo. Each move has a separate effect in a contest than it would in a battle. For example, in battle, Growl only lowers an enemy's attack by one stage and isn't that useful. But in contest in Auras, it's really great if you use it when your Pokemon is last in the lineup, and it happens to be a cute move that will help win the crowd over. Each move does something different, so always read the descriptions and use them strategically. If you use a move like Growl when your Pokemon is going first for appeals, it's not going to be a great use of that and it won't net you many hearts. When you're looking at contest moves, you'll notice they have two different ratings for appeal and jam. Appeal is simply how many hearts that move will get you under basic circumstances, such as using Growl first rather than last. The number of hearts it can get you can change based on the context it's used. If a move has a jam rating, it means it's likely to make other competing contest Pokemon lose hearts that turn if you use it. Another important factor to keep in mind is how well your moves are going to work together. You can have one really good move with lots of appeal, but it won't do you any good to just spam it over and over, because it'll bore the judges and you'll end up losing hearts. So make sure to have some good moves that you can alternate between to get you the maximum possible number of hearts in the appeal round. For our Plusle, I'm going to give it Rest and Snore two cute moves that work great together, and even have an additional heart bonus if used as a combo. There are lots of moves that make hidden combos for extra points, so do your best to include at least one combo in your moveset. Growl will work well if Plusl ends up last in the lineup, and Attract is just there if I feel like being annoying to the other Pokemon and making them too nervous to move. They probably won't actually use it that much. If you want to perform well in a contest, it's important to have moves that are the same type as the contest you're entered in, so that you can excite the crowd at the optimum moment. Using other type moves can either have no positive effect on the crowd, or even negatively impact their excitement, depending on how compatible with the type of contest the type of move is. This can also be a good thing depending on the situation, but generally it's a good idea to stick to cute moves in a cute contest, clever moves in a clever contest, and so on and so forth. There are also little things you can do to help your Pokemon out in the appeal round, like making it wear a scarf corresponding to the color of the contest they're entering, or even manipulating a hidden mechanic called Luster, but that's not usually necessary for winning your way through contests. If you have a good appeal plan and take advantage of Pokeblocks, you should be fine without worrying about that. Now that we have our Pokemon as cute as can be and all set up to wow the judges, it's time to enter it in a contest. Each contest consists of two rounds, the primary judging and appeal rounds. In primary judging, the audience reacts to your Pokemon based on the contest stats you manipulated with Pokeblocks. So the more you feed your Pokemon Pokeblocks, the more the crowd will just love them right off the bat. This can make a huge difference in the outcome of a contest, since it can account to up to 50% of your score, and can turn even a badly played appeal round into a victory overall. The next round, the appeal round, begins pretty quickly after that, and this is where your Pokemon's moves will come into play. You should already have some idea of how this is going to go based on what moves you gave your Pokemon, but remember that other Pokemon have their own strategies, and that it's important to work around them. So keep an eye on the excitement of the crowd. You want to make sure the last star shows up on the turn you appeal, and not on an opponent's turn. They could get a huge amount of hearts that would make it difficult for you to win. If you haven't already figured it out, the goal of this round is to use the right moves at the right time to get you as many hearts as possible. Once this round is over, your primary judging score is added to the amount of hearts you earned in the appeal round, and the Pokemon with the highest overall score is the winner of the contest. It's really not difficult to master this, but it does get trickier the higher up the ranks you go, so it can be a fun challenge. There are some benefits to winning your way through the contest. You can get yourself a Lucario Knight for finishing all five Master Rank contests and challenging Alicia, plus a secret base decoration. And if you clear every single contest with a single Pokemon, that Pokemon gets a special ribbon and a special effect in battle. Also, contests are fun! 
I love that they give me a chance to use Pokemon that aren't really born battlers, and that they're a fun little puzzle to solve that require you to use moves in creative ways. I'm a little bummed that they never introduced Wi-Fi contests in any generation, because I feel like they'd be way more popular if that was the case. But either way, I hope this little explanation was helpful to you, and good luck in the contest. Twilight Sparkle requests Monster Hunter, just to be a little different. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for today, but who knows, I might do another one of these in the future. Next week, I'm really hoping to have the video finished that's been in the works for a while, so hopefully that'll go up, and then the Gen 2 glitch videos will start up again sometime this month or next month. Thanks for watching, and if you want to see a review of a spin-off game I didn't mention, XD Gale of Darkness, you can click here to see what I thought about it. Or if you want to see my old collection video, you can click here to watch it. As always, don't forget to click here to subscribe for more Pokemon videos every week. See ya!